joining. I um, haven't, I've done this presentation a number of times, but I've never done it uh, over WebEx. So we'll see how this goes. I think it'll, it should be fine. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the parts of Yellowstone that most people don't really think about unless they get out and, and really look at the signs and read read um, information that's out there. And it's focus on the microbes that live in the hot springs. And um, as an engineer, I uh, like to make new discoveries, but I like to use them to uh, potentially use them for applications to help society, for example, making biofuels or enzymes to break down cellulose into making ethanol, things like that. So um, try to do a little, a little bit of both, finding new things and then finding things to, to do with those uh, organisms. As I mentioned to Sydney, um, I have a new puppy, I'm at home. If she starts to be really loud, I'm gonna have to jump up and take her outside. So just, um, we'll just, I'll take a two minute coffee break if, if that happens, but uh, just giving you a heads up. So Yellowstone is the result of huge volcanic uh, eruptions um, over millions of years. And um, some of these volcanic eruptions were, um, very large. I mean, you guys are probably not around um, for any of these. Even Mount St. Helens was uh, quite a while, while ago now. Um, but the the Yellowstone caldera had eruptions that were on the order of um, 600 cubic miles of material that came out of the of the volcano. It's hard to wrap your mind around what 600 cubic miles is actually but if you um drive from bozeman to seattle if you've ever done that drive it's about a 12 hour drive maybe 10 somewhere in that range um 681 miles if you drove i-90 all the way to seattle 50 miles on each side of you so 100 mile wide swath 46 feet deep all the way from Bozeman to Seattle. That's the amount of material that came out of uh, the Yellowstone caldera 2 million years ago. Um, to put another in perspective, it, it would be 21 feet deep on all every square inch of Montana um, if it all landed within our borders. And so you know, we'd all be uh, wishing we had three-story houses at that point. Uh, so anyway, it was a huge amount of material. What's left, though, is a caldera that is about 40 miles across by 30 miles um, north to south and approximately 11,000 thermal features. Uh, Yellowstone has about 55% of the world's hot springs, and so it's an excellent place to study um, the microbes and the geochemistry, biogeochemistry in the hot springs. Um, <clears throat> less than, it may be up to 2% now, should probably update this slide, but um, of those hot springs have ever been characterized for microbial life. And so when I when I talk about that, I mean go somebody going in, taking a sample, um, uh, finding out what organisms are there based on DNA extractions or trying to grow them. And so it means 98% of these 11,000 thermal features are still out there uh, waiting for somebody to come and see see what lives lives in them. So I'm the director of the Thermal Biology Institute. It was established um, more than 20 years ago here at MSU. Uh, I, I wasn't one of the people that established it, but it's focused on the um, on research and education in biological, physical, and chemical processes of high temperature environments, and particularly in Yellowstone. So Yellowstone has changed quite a bit. Um, Years ago, it was, you know, little bear cubs begging for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at the gate. And uh, now, basically, the bears are much more wild and, and scientifically studied by tracking them remotely with, with satellites and trying to understand the behavior uh, more scientifically and less touristically. It's the same with the hot springs. You know, there's a lot of gee whiz about Old Faithful, but, um, you know, and it goes off every so often and whatnot, but 
when you start looking at some of the hot springs in more depth from a, a scientific perspective, you see that there's many, many different micro environments even within the same thermal feature. And so uh, this one, you can see the bright orange near boiling, um, probably a, a low pH acidic. Um, and then the, the spring just to the left of that is kind of a clear, uh, not as hot, maybe a very different pH. And um, those two different springs, even though they're you know three or four inches apart, would have vastly different microbial communities in them. So the, the organisms that live in the orange water uh, probably would not survive in the, the clearish, grayish water on the left. And there's also photosynthetic organisms in these springs or and living on the edges. You can see the green rim around the, uh, the spring at the bottom. And so when I look at these hot springs, I think of all the potential different organisms that live in there. So photosynthetic, um, here she goes, uh, photosynthetic and um, fungi, bacteria, archaea. And, hold on a minute. You better get out of here. Come on. Out, 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 out. Okay. She's only four months old and cute as a button, but uh, anyway. So the um, organisms that live in there are, are unique, and very few of them have ever been characterized to any, any extent. So what, what live in hot springs? They're organisms called thermophiles. They um, thrive at extremely high temperatures. So a moderate thermophile would live at temperatures of 50 to 70 degrees C. And so just to put that in perspective, if you, um, after, the, after the talk here, go turn your hot water on full, full blast hot, it's probably around 60 degrees C. So that's kind of mid-range for the low temperature thermophiles. Um, the high temperature thermophiles can live uh, from 80 degrees C up above the boiling point of, of water. And actually that number is going up. Um, uh, there, there are people growing organisms at even higher temperatures than, than 113. Um, these thermophiles often tolerate other extreme conditions can you guys hear me or is she just too obnoxious? We can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, can you just like bark tell... but not too bad? Okay. No it's worries. What... Okay, thank you. Um, they can tolerate other extreme conditions like uh, toxic metals, um, low pH, so basically living in boiling acid or high pH, uh, very alkaline systems. So, Thermophiles are considered some of the oldest uh, organisms. If you have this kind of generic tree of life, um, any of those groupings with a red circle around it is an or those groups have organisms that are thermotolerant or thermophilic. Um, and so the thermophiles are believed to be some of the oldest um, uh, organisms on the planet. And I'm not going to read that. You have to read it yourself. Okay. So why study thermophilic systems? Um, they basically, they have very unique biogeochemical bio interactions. The, the high temperatures give um, thermodynamic possibilities to, or, to reactions that don't occur at lower temperatures. Um, gives us a, a better understanding of the biodiversity of the Earth, studying not just thermophilic systems, but um, Arctic systems and high salt, you know, like the Great Salt Lake and um, high pH systems. Uh, all these extreme systems give us a better idea of the breadth of life and, and potential for, to look for life on other planets. So the signatures from these organisms uh, can help us find life on other planets. Um, they provide clues to conditions on early Earth and evolution. Um, only about 1% of these thermophiles have ever been grown in a laboratory. And so there's 
99% of these extreme organisms that can operate at very high temperatures, um, potentially with uh, industrial uses and things like that, uh, has a huge biotech potential for society. Uh, more than half the pharmaceuticals in the U.S. contain at least one major active compound from natural or patterned after natural compounds. And so places like Yellowstone, national parks, um, and other, other areas that are preserved, unique areas that are preserved, become increasingly important sources of biodiversity. And there are more and more people looking for organisms in these environments that may be um, a biotech potential. I was out in Yellowstone earlier this year with a group of um, veterinarians looking for um, some novel uh, antibiotic, antibacterial, antiviral kind of compounds for, um, for use in dogs and cats. And so you just never, never quite know what's going what's gonna to come up and come out of these um, unique systems. So how about a, a real application? Um, basically, you guys are living in the, the biotech revolution. Um, when I started school, there was no DNA amplification. Uh, you, know, you didn't, all the, the COVID tests that we're doing now are based on the ability to amplify uh, DNA and RNA. And so that comes from an organism that, that was discovered in Yellowstone called Thermus aquaticus was discovered, the enzyme was discovered in 1985. And um, basically it's called TAC polymerase and it was a new way to replicate DNA. And so think of it as a DNA photocopier if you want to, but uh, that's kind of what it, what it did is allow us to, to replicate DNA to high enough concentrations that we could actually sequence it and have a, get a unique sequence. And so currently, if anybody's ever seen CSI, um, you know, they grab the, grab, find a hair or, a, you know, whatever, get a, get a swab off of a discarded coffee cup and get somebody's DNA. It's used all the time for criminal identification. Um, medical diagnoses like the COVID um, human genome project, being able to sequence the entire human genome is given a lot of insights into a number of different um, uh, health issues. It's also used in managing Yellowstone's grizzly bears, actually. If, if a bear uh, does a bear crime, you know, steal somebody's lunch or attack somebody or whatever, then they get a, find a hair from that bear and uh, use PCR to amplify it. And, and when they catch, catch a bear, they make sure that it was, it was the one that caused the problem before they deport it to the Bob Marshall or uh, um, put it down or something, depending on what it did. So it's interesting that it's that Yellowstone is using a uh, technology that was basically born in the, the hot springs here. Another interesting one, I'm headed down actually Saturday to do some um, sampling. This is a, a um, grass called panic grass and it, it Resists high temperature. It grows right on the edge of hot springs in very high temperature uh, soils. And it turns out that this grass has to have a certain fungus growing on its roots to be able to resist those high temperatures. There's a picture of the fungus up in the upper right. Um, turns out you can take this fungus and transfer it to um, seeds like these bean sprouts up in the top right. And the ones on the right that got the fungus from this pan of grass can grow at much higher temperatures. And these are all in centigrade, so 38, 40, up to 50 degrees without um, dying. And the ones that didn't get the fungus die off at 40 degrees C. Uh, so there's actually a spin-off company that is using this to develop a drought and heat tolerant crops that can be used for um, uh, especially maybe with, with global climate change, uh, it's maybe more and more important to have crops that can grow it, at much higher temperatures. And again, that is some, an application, a biotech application that, that is coming out of um, Yellowstone National Park. 
One of the interesting things is this fungus converts the heat tolerance, but also there ha the fungus has to have a virus that triggers that response uh, in the fungus that triggers the response in the plant. And so it's, it's a much deeper um, biological system than anybody uh, thought at first. And so what we're doing Saturday actually is going down to sample the roots of these plants and see if there's other microorganisms, other bacteria that um, uh, help help the plant survive in these high temperatures and how do those organisms uh, interact with, with the plants that um, to help them survive in these, these high temperatures. So with each, um, each organism that you find in the hot springs, there's probably six to 10 different viruses that are living in there and, and um, attacking these microorganisms constantly. And uh, so that's a whole, that's a, another study, another area of study of the Thermal Biology Institute. And Mark Young, in um, plant sciences is one of the world's experts on identifying and characterizing these um, high temperature extremophilic viruses. So most of the work that I do uh, is in the Heart Lake Geyser Basin. It's a alkaline um, series of springs. This picture, you would be, you'd be about five and a half miles from the nearest road and looking down into the Heart Lake Geyser Basin, that um, it's about almost two miles to Heart Lake from here. Um, and it's just filled with, with thermal sites. The first uh, three years that we did studies there, most of what we did was just walk around with a GPS, a pH meter, and a thermometer and find where all these springs were and get an idea of what, what we were dealing with. Wake up, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> and the, um, sorry, you can turn your video off. I won't do that again. I'm just, um, we have no shortage of people who are interested in coming in and sampling with us. Um, there's, we do trips every summer. We are actually, like I said, planning a trip um, this weekend. We're um, heading into Heart Lake as part of a um, extreme microbiology of Yellowstone course that's taught through the honors program uh, heading in, in in September, coming up fast. And uh, we basically, um, two groups of six students spend three, four days and three nights in the backcountry sampling these hot springs. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years and so at a number of a variety of trips and, and uh, there's always, always something to do. Um, and this is basically what a typical visit to a hot spring would look like is somebody would be sampling with a long um, sampling pole. You can see the, the uh, she's an undergrad, Michelle on the, on the left, uh, getting ready to sample some of the sediments in the springs. Um, I actually had a high school student in with us. She did her, her uh, science fair project on this spring. And we actually named this spring after her because it didn't really have a name. So it's called Gabby Spring. Her name is Gabby. Uh, we basically get to name name these springs for our, our studies because they're, you know, we're six miles from the road and see very few people back there. Um, Dana Skarupa, the, the person running there on the right, is the the instructor of our extreme microbiology of Yellowstone. Um, she may be small, but she can carry more in her backpack than, than I can possibly ever hope to carry. She's an a amazing instructor and amazing um, uh, person to have leading these, these studies. We do see bears back there once in a while, but we make a lot of noise. You can see both of these bears are going the other direction, um, but it is a, a bear uh, area and it's actually closed until July 1st um, because of the high numbers of bears that are that are out there. We pretty much see a grizzly almost every year, uh, but we sing sing Disney songs and make loud noises and and so they're always running the other direction uh, by the time we see them. Thankfully, see wolf tracks. 
back there where we're sampling, but never see the wolves. Thought we saw their eyes one night while we were camping, but it's hard to tell what it was. So we got started on this. We had a, um, a Department of Defense project. A student was looking at the ability of these um, microorganisms to break down organics at high temperatures. And so there's a natural chemical process called alkaline hydrolysis that breaks things down at high temperatures and high pHs. And we wanted to see if the bacteria could accelerate those um, reactions. And so we went to Heart Lake, grabbed some high temperature, high pH bacteria, and challenged them with um, TNT. And basically, we did an abiotic control, and we did a, um, an experiment, some experiments with, with the microorganisms. And we found that we could, we could accelerate the de degradation of TNT over the natural alkaline hydrolysis process. Um, the same thing goes for lignin and cellulose deg degradation. So for um, uh, renewable energy applications, I believe it would work with pesticides, although I've never tried it. it it's a, something I've wanted to do. Um, so it would be a fabulous undergraduate scholars program uh, project for somebody. Um, and then also has applications to uh, nylon production and oil refining. We did quite a bit of work on the, the alkaline degradation of um, phenol in uh, wastewater uh, a number of years ago. So these organisms have applications that um, can, be, uh, can be exploited in properties. So this is an example of lignin. So basically lignin is the um, material that uh, keeps the trees upright and uh, gives them their, their structure. And it, right now, most lignin, like at paper plants, are, is just um, burned for its energy. So there's a lot of aromatic compounds. Lignin can be used to make um, uh, a lot of flavor compounds, high value flavor compounds, but so far nobody's really doing it. So we're looking for organisms that can break lignin down because when we look in these hot springs, there may be a tree that fell into the hot spring and um, there's branches all over and any branch that touches the water is just gone, eaten off at the water's surface. And we don't see branches and leaves um, for the most part in the bottoms of these springs. And so uh, we've got a number of organisms that uh, can grow solely on lignin and um, starting to publish papers on that and also look at the enzymes that they uh, use to break these complex molecules down into something that could be useful for, um, for chemicals. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but basically um, the bottom box is the blank with no uh, microorganisms and it's the uh, degradation of lignin, the size of the bar, and so we, any, any of the springs that we tried accelerated the degradation of, of lignin by uh, at least five or 10 times um, uh, during the test that we run. We've also grown these organisms um, on renewable uh, things like corn stover, corn cobs, uh, lodgepole pine sawdust, and uh, they seem to like the corn stover and the, and the sawdust better than the corn cobs. I don't know why, but uh, so we're looking at um, the possibility of using some of these materials to uh, also create uh, useful chemicals. So I'm gonna go into some of the more fundamental stuff that we've done. This is a study of um, three springs that are all within about 10 meters of each other. And um, they all have the same pH, 8.5 but the temperature is of one is 44 degrees C, which is not much hotter than your hot tub, uh, 63 degrees C, which is about as hot as your hot water heater water comes out, and then 75 degrees C, which is extremely hot, and you don't want to even accidentally get your fingers in that water. Um, one thing to notice is the um, different uh, visually of the characteristics of the springs. The um, top one has a bunch of um, orange photosynthetic pigments. 
The 63 degree C has a bunch of uh, green photosynthetic pi pigments and the 75 degree C, you don't see any of that in there. And that's because 72 degrees C at these pHs, 72 degrees C is, a, is the hottest temperature that even um, bacterial photosynthesis can occur. And so these, these higher temperature springs are typically um, much clearer, much less organic material, much more extreme environments than um, anything under 72 degrees C. So what we did with these, and go back, we basically took our sampling pole, scooped out some of the, the dirt and sediment and, and biomass coming out of these springs, and we extracted the DNA and looked at what um, different organisms were there based on their DNA signatures. And I don't, I'm not going to read all the Latin names on the right, but basically the take-home message here is Look at the, the number of different patterns on the 44 degrees C. Lots of different organisms um, for the most part. Uh, even at 63 degrees C, lots of different organisms over multiple years of sampling. But once we get up above 72 to the 75 degrees C, the um, uh, numbers of organisms drops way down. So we have basically in 2008, that spring was dominated by three different organisms. In 2009, dominated by two, I guess, or, or one, even if you want to say it. Um, uh, interestingly, some of these, many of these organisms have never been grown uh, in the laboratory. So that nitrous acaldus, the one with the arrow, um, we know it exists. We can grow it in the presence of other organisms, but uh, when we try to isolate it and grow it in a pure culture, um, nobody has been able to do that. Um, there's other other archaea in there, bacteria basically um, from an older lineage that are uh, called egg archaeota. They also, um, we know they exist. Sometimes they dominate the um, uh, system. They, they would be in that green bar in 2008. But nobody in the world has ever grown one of those in the laboratory. And so we're just finishing a project where we're doing everything we can um, with all the modern omics techniques. So looking at all the organisms' metabolites, looking at all their um, DNA transcription, looking at uh, a variety of other geochemical processes to see if we can what we can learn about how this organism lives um, without being able to grow it. And maybe we'll gain enough insights into someday being able to grow this organism in a laboratory so we can study it more carefully. This is um, Gabby's spring. You can see the water comes out there at, at C0 at 91 degrees C, so nearly boiling at, at that elevation. That elevation, um, Boiling point of water is 92, 93 degrees C, and it flows down and gradually cools. I like this spring because you can see exactly where the 72 degree line is, where the, the coloring goes from clear, where there's no photosynthetic organisms, to um, a deep green where photosynthesis can occur. And that's basically just because the temperature drops a little bit into that 70, uh, 71 degree. Uh, range. When we look at Gabby Spring, we see a number of different organisms. Um, this chart you, you read by uh, looking at a circle. The circle represents the number, a relative percentage of the organisms of that uh, different genus. And the interesting thing is um, most of the, some of the circles line up with organisms that uh, People have grown in the lab before. The um, one kind of over to the left, I don't know if I have a pointer on this or not. Um, let me see. Well, I'll just, I'll just describe it. Yeah. Um, the one on the left is that nitrous caldus, again, that nobody's grown, but the 
the circles on the right hand side of that graph are unknown archaea. And so you look at that and basically 50% or more in some of those samples um, are organisms that we don't even know enough about to put a genus name on, right? So that's that's very, very unknown. Um, we have the DNA signature. We know that, that organism, those organisms exist, but um, they're so different from anything that's been named so far that we, we, you can't put names on at the genus level. Just to kind of put that in perspective, that would be like coming across an animal and not knowing whether it was an orca whale or a wolf, right? I mean, that, that's, how diff, that's how different um, these organisms are genetically, okay? So it's a very wide open area of research. Here's another table that um, shows the, the archaea. The green pie pieces are ones that somebody has grown at least one organism from that group in their lab. The others, um, the yellow, they're uncultured, so nobody's ever grown it in their lab, but we do have genomes available. And then the red ones are, nobody's ever grown it in their laboratory, so it's uncultured and the, there are no genomes available uh, for these organisms either. And so still wide open uh, area of research for understanding, even just growing these uh, archaea. So this just, I love this picture. It's one of the, the areas in the Heart Lake area where um, this shows the diversity of environments that you can find even in one, um, one little, section of Yellowstone. So uh, through the center, that is a creek called Witch Creek. It's a pH 10 and uh, about 50 degrees C there, so too hot for um, soaking. It turns out it cools off further down and there's a nice bridge by the trail where you can um, soak, in the, uh, soak in the creek. But uh, on the left, there's a, there's a spring that we've never even sampled because getting out to it, uh, that bottom left, getting out to it looks so dangerous that um, we don't even think we could get close enough to it to, to get a sample from it. Um, some of the others in the middle are boiling, 92 degrees C. You can see the, um, the water coming down from the, from the top is uh, cooler. It's got that uh, orange photosynthetic pigment in it. Again, just each of those environments has very different microorganisms uh, in them. And to give you an idea of the scale, um, the, those three guys are each about six feet tall. And so it's, it's a big feature. You can see it on Google Earth with, with no problem. <clears throat> we have one spring that is, uh, used to be intermittent and, and is now starting to be more um, flowing all the time. Things change quite a bit. 91 degrees C, pH almost 9. I didn't put that little skull in the back, but I uh, thought it made some interesting um, visuals for this. Uh, basically, we sampled that for a number of years and never got enough um, DNA out of it to even figure out what organisms were there. Finally, one year we sampled 20 or 30 liters of water onto a filter. So we filtered all the, all the microbes out of 20 or 30 liters of water and um, found that it had four bacteria and eight archaea. The bacteria we could put genus names on, the archaea, half of them again, which is pretty typical, were so different that we couldn't even put a, a genus name to the, to the DNA. So again, don't know if it's an orca whale or, or a wolf or a puppy or whatever. Yeah, just nothing. Okay. One of the things that we um, were trying to do and are actually working on a, uh, turns out, $50 million proposal to um, do some more work on this is um, growing microorganisms on electrodes. And so most, you know, you think about, Let's say you're making beer or wine. You guys probably aren't quite old enough to make beer or wine yet, but um, you put in sugar and uh, 
the organisms ferment that as a, as a food source and carbon source, it turns out you can actually hook up electrodes to solar panels or batteries and grow microorganisms that use the electrons from the electrode rather than getting those electrons from glucose um, and will grow on, on electrodes. And so we're, uh, a couple of years ago, we put some electrodes in the spring shown on the right, uh, put them in for six weeks and let the microbes grow uh, just on positive and negative electrodes. And we had um, uncharged controls. Um, here's a picture of the electrodes in the spring. So we just got this paper um, published, uh, I think this year, maybe at the end of last year. Um, but basically you see the electrodes in the springs and then we came back and we covered those, um, scraped off the, the DNA and, and sequenced it to see, see what grew. Um, turns out that the, um, we got a lot more biomass. So this is the amount of DNA recovered off of a square centimeter of, of the electrodes. Um, when we provided the electrons to these um, hot springs. And so providing electrons is basically the same. We do the same thing when we eat pizza, right? We're, we're eating pizza. It gives us the um, uh, electrons to uh, put on carbon dioxide or to put on um, oxygen to make carbon dioxide. And so by providing these electrons through, a, through an electrode, we got uh, nearly 10 times more DNA on the um, uh, positively charged electrodes than the negatively charged electrodes. Um, it turns out that there were a number of different um, species that we were able to grow that uh, had, hadn't been grown before. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the details, but essentially that's one of the things that we're looking at for this new proposal is putting these with 50% with of the organisms, we don't even know what they are, and 90% that are difficult to grow in the lab, um, we're trying new ways to, um, to grow these organisms, again, using these uh, polarized cathodes and anodes. There's a variety of other things that this proposal will, will work on, but that's kind of what, what we're working on for Yellowstone. Whoops. Um, one of the interesting things, so we've done some studies on uh, how different is Yellowstone from other locations, other thermal locations in the world. And so how many springs do you have to sample to really know what's out there? And this, this graph shows that uh, the green diamonds are the Yellowstone microorganisms. And uh, they're very different from the organisms in Tibet. They're very different from the organisms in Romania and Kenya and Japan. And so you know, we're studying one, one group of these, but to really get an idea of the global diversity of thermophiles, um, we're going to have to start doing a lot more traveling. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. OK, um, one of the applications that we've done is um, looking at the production of algal biofuels. And so we isolated a number of cultures from the photosynthetic portions of hot spring outlets. And there's a, a grad student, Jake, taking a sample. We bring those back to the lab and characterize those. And this would be an example of an algae culture. They, um, if they make biofuels, they will, if we stain them with a, a certain stain called Nile Red, they will fluoresce bright yellow if they have a bunch of uh, basically oil inside of them. And so this is under regular light microscope. If we hit them with Nile red and then put the fluorescence on, you can see that those organisms have a lot of, a lot of oil inside of their, um, their bodies, basically. Some of the, many of the organisms that we see have um, 25 to 50% oil by weight. Um, we also found that if you, I'm just going to look at the right-hand graph there, that's the fluorescence, so the, the amount of yellow uh, in, the, in the screen um, when we look at them. 
We also found that under normal conditions, it may take two weeks to produce a high amount of, um, of lipids or oil from these algae. But if we um, hit them with a little baking soda at just the right time, that black arrow there, we can produce the same amount of lipids, same amount of oil in half the amount of time. And so we actually patented that a few years ago and have published a number of papers um, and continue to do work on the effect of, of baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate on um, growing algae and, and other high value products from algae. And that came from Yellowstone, uh, studies of Yellowstone. So here's what the oil looks like from these um, algae. It looks just like olive oil. And actually you can go to the store now and buy algae oil um, in the store to uh, use in cooking. And uh, anyway, you definitely should try it out. The other thing we found was a diatom strain RGD1. It's a, diatoms are basically little um, photosynthetic organisms that live in silica shells. So little organisms that live in glass houses, essentially. Beautiful little things under an electron microscope. But uh, these guys, when we look at them under regular light microscopy, that's what they look like. Under uh, Nile red staining and fluorescence, they have massive amounts of lipids inside, up to 70% oil by weight. Um, thankfully, I'm not 70% oil by weight. But we've seen them produce so much lipid that they actually blow their uh, lipid uh, blow their silica shells apart. And so we're currently working, finishing up a PhD student working on the um, sequencing the genome of this, trying to get an idea of the pathways that it uses and the control that it uses to um, make these very high lipid concentrations, again, for um, biofuel production. So this also responds to the sodium bicarbonate trigger you can see the black line is with no sodium bicarbonate, and again, the amount of um, lipids that it makes. And uh, with sodium bicarbonate, we double both the rate and the extent of uh, lipid production. We have so many isolates, we can't possibly characterize them all. You go to the field, sample one day, and you get a dozen isolates and spend five years studying one of them. So there's, there's way more possible projects out there than um, students to do them. Uh, this is one of my students' favorites. It's called Godzilla. They call it Godzilla. It's a huge organism. Um, uh, you can see it's about 30 microns across, and that little fuzzy stuff on it is uh, bacteria growing. So there's a lot of interest in how do bacteria and algae and diatoms interact with each other to help or hurt the, the growth of those organisms. So a lot of um, this, a lot of studies on the, the um, basically the metagenome of different microbes. This thing produces enough uh, algal oil that you can see it even in, with a light microscope without staining it. Again, as an engineer, we done some process scale up with this. We've done a number of pilot scale tests uh, at raceways at MSU. We have we now have four 200 liter raceways at MSU. So grow them in this kind of racetrack looking bioreactor. And we also collaborate with other universities to, to do even larger scale uh, growth studies. Some of the future work that we're doing, we've got a lot of um, samples out for um, metagenomics. We're, trying to find basically characterizing all the organisms that are there. We're looking at their um, metabolome. So all the metabolites that they make for storage compounds or um, uh, energy compounds. We are doing studies on the uh, proteome. So what all the different proteins that these organisms have, still a lot of work to do on those. Um, and again, continuing on these alternative culturing approaches with the, um, especially with the electrodes as uh, electron donors and acceptors. Um, I'm gonna skip that one for now. 
So again, we do this um, extreme microbiology of Yellowstone course. It's a great place to uh, get out and learn microbial ecology away from the crowds and you know, spend the day with a, a, a scientist by the side of a hot spring. Um, we do a lot of outreach as TBI. So we spend a lot of time with uh, elementary school kids doing art projects and, and have a number of educational outreach kind of stuff. Um, do some acknowledgements. I'm not going to read all the names to you. Just so you know, I don't do all this stuff myself. I work with a lot of people that um, in TBI that 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 do these things. We've gotten funding from a variety of foundations, including the Turner Foundation, Keck Foundation, the Department of Energy, MSU helps us out some, uh, and then finally, uh, thank you all for your attention. And if you have questions uh, after the fact. Um, our website's there and my email is there. Feel free to, to get in contact with me. Okay. At this point, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Sophia, you can go ahead and unmute mute yourself and ask. Sophia, dead, 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 Annette. Sorry, you must be muted. Let's see if I can help unmute you. Thank you all for coming, by the way. This Thank you all for coming, by the way. There's so many of you. I'm trying to find Sophia in this list. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Everybody was so quiet and attentive. <laughs> Sophia, if you want to type your question, I can see the chat now. So if if that works. While we're waiting for Sophia, um, does anyone else have any questions? Walter, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask. Hello, Walter. There you go. What's your question for Dr. Payton? I think you're still on mute. Try now. It looks like it's remuting him every time he does it. I'll answer Sophia's real quick and uh, maybe start the muting out. Um, Number of microbial species discovered in my career. Um, I've personally been involved in naming probably four or five different species. Um, a lot of currently there's not as much effort put into the, the detailed characterization to name an organism because it, it really takes quite a bit of, of uh, uh, extra effort to do do enough analysis to name something, but, uh, but on the order, order of about four or five different organisms. Walter, do you want to try one more time? Yeah, I think I got it. I'm not sure what was happening, but um, I, I live over by Portland on, on the Columbia River. That's downstream of that Hanford site. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. you, you were talking about the applications of micro, uh, microbiology of like breaking down TNT or other things like that. Yeah. I've heard a few things about like breaking down nuclear waste. And I was just wondering if you had found anything or had done research or knew anything about potentially breaking down nuclear 
byproducts using sure. microbiology? So actually I'm an MSU grad. I got my PhD here years and years ago. And my first job was at Hanford uh, in Washington. And that's how I got started working with uh, extreme, extremophile microorganisms was looking at what microorganisms could do to help um, decontaminate some of the Hanford tank, tank waste. You know, they got millions and millions of gallons of uh, very high, high salt, high pH um, radioactive waste in those tanks. And so we started looking at um, organisms from uh, an extreme environment called Soap Lake in Washington. You may have heard of it, may have seen it on the signs as you drive back and forth. Um, and again, finding organisms from these extreme environments that can break down some of the contaminants. Um, we also did quite a bit of work with um, microbes that can uh, reduce uranium. Basically, uranium is, is soluble when it's in the oxidized form and is reduced. When you reduce it using microbes, um, it precipitates in place. And so you can stop the movement of a contaminated plume. Um, currently, yeah. I'm doing a big project up in Canada where we, um, we started out with test tubes, basically, and using microbes to precipitate um, selenium, which is a toxic heavy metal, and reduce nitrate. And they're currently treating uh, 2 million gallons a day of contaminated mine water. And we're working on the design of another facility to do just the same thing at a different, uh, different location. And so um, the company I'm working for expects to save about half a billion dollars over the next 10 years using these microbial technologies. So they're very excited about it. And so I've been doing this kind of stuff ever since I graduated from MSU years and years ago. Thank you so much. I think we have one more question from Spencer um, in the chat. And his question is, how do these hot springs affect the other aquatic systems in Yellowstone? Um, so they, they do, uh, you know, for example, the, um, if you've ever gone to the Gardner River and sat in the boiling, the boiling river, the hot pots, you know that there's some higher temperature uh, environments. Um, the uh, there's a variety of of things that you know that that change with the high temperature water coming in, but um, typically. Uh, the amount of water that comes out of the hot springs is so much less than is flowing past the hot springs that it gets diluted pretty quickly uh, for the most part. And it's not really a, a very negative impact on the on the rivers and whatnot. But a lot of these hot springs can have very high concentrations of, of toxic materials like arsenic, uh, mercury, um, acids, those kinds of things, but, but they get diluted out pretty quick. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's a car alarm now at my apartment, but the next question is from Gunner. Is the purpose okay. of the metagenomic and meta, if actually, if you can see I it, can that's read that. It. If you want to mute myself, I can so read get it. rid of the annoying. There we go. Is the purpose of the metagenomic uh, metabolic and metaproteomic analyses to characterize a minimal process whereby you can optimize the production of algal biofuel relative to the material requirements for sustaining the producers? If so, how far along has this process been developed? So we are in the process of um, trying to understand the genome, genomic material, the um, metabolisms, and the, the proteins with these um, algae and how they respond to different systems. Um, the Department of Energy has, we've got quite a bit of funding from them. Um, they have set goals as to how much algae we have to be able to produce per square meter of raceway pond per day to even hope to, to break even on algal biofuels costs. And so uh, right now, I think we could make a gallon of biodiesel for probably 
fifteen dollars. So um, nobody's going to buy it, right? It, when you can buy three dollars worth, three dollars a gallon regular diesel down at the the store. And so um, we're trying everything we can to uh, learn about the the microorganisms, optimize the process to um, make it more more efficient. And so that's what these uh, studies are, are targeted on. So how far along? We still got a ways and with current gas prices, you know, in the $2 range, it's going to be a while before anybody sees any algal biofuels at the pump. If there are no more questions, um, Ray has posted the link for credit in the bio. Um, so in the next 72 hours, you can go there and get credit. And we thank you so much, Dr. Payton, for such a wonderful presentation. It was very thank enlightening you. and exciting to hear. Thanks for inviting me. I, I, I enjoy doing it. Good to see everybody. And I encourage you to check into our honors Extreme Microbiology Yellowstone course. It's a, it's a fun, you know, basically have you in the field the second or third week of class sampling hot springs. So. That sounds like a wonderful opportunity. I'm glad all of these freshmen get to hear about it early. Thank Feel you. Feel free to share much. my email if with anybody if they want it to. So okay. Thank you. See you all. Have a good evening. Have a lovely evening, evening, everybody. Everybody. Ooh, pardon me. <laughs>